Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you, everybody else, for coming to join us and not uh, quitting, at least not yet, when Kathleen mentioned the O word, ontology. It is an ontology talk. I cannot, didn't even attempt to hide it. I was That's a bit worried when, when you, Kathleen, invited me to a smart seminar series, but then I noticed the double A, so there's this hesitation of smart, smart uh, that comes with it, and I guess I'm fine. Um, granularity as a core concept of spatial information, although at least for now and possibly at the end, you may still doubt to what extent this has to do with uh, multi-scale spatial analysis. I think it has to, at least in my mind, and I'm trying to be relatively brief and leave enough time at the end to discuss questions that you might have in bringing these topics closer together. I'll start with just a couple of stories that uh, I guess brought home the importance of scale and multi-scale analysis and thinking uh, to me. This one is actually very old. This is from probably the eighties or so during my graduate studies. Um, in Switzerland, where I was studying at ETH at the time, uh, this was the time when digital spatial information first became an important topic of research and also of practice. And I remember a talk by a practitioner at the Institute coming to us with the latest uh, ideas about standardizing spatial information about the country and about its parts and uh, showing us something that rightly so, I guess, Swiss servers have always been very proud of. You see an excerpt on the top, which is uh, a, a, a specific type of map of Switzerland at the scale of roughly one to 10,000, uh, which is in some sense, importantly, rock bottom of everything that we know about Switzerland spatially. And this person then went on to say, now with the new technology, with GIS, with um, cartography, automated generalization to some extent, we can have this rock bottom piece in our uh, systems and then just generalize up to any arbitrary scale that we would like to see our country at. And some of us started wondering, okay, so I can see the buildings there and I can see the roads. And now how do I get to like my hometown of Zurich from that? Uh, how does the system figure out where Zurich is by zooming out of this? And, and even further, how do we get to the cantons or states? How do we get to the whole country? And obviously the, 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 the lesson or the, the, the uh, the, the thing that maybe was missed in, in, these first, in this first enthusiasm of, of scaling up or scale free spatial data was mm -hmm. well, some concepts make sense at certain scales. And there is not much to be found about, say, the canton of Zurich, uh, even if you put together all these necessary uh, larger scale maps and try to generalize from them. Second, uh, I think more impressive, at least to me, story was maybe roughly a decade later. Um, there was apparently a, uh, a, a GIS, well, clearly a GIS was used in a so-called cut and fill analysis of a project where maybe a road or a, a railway line was built. And this, uh, the, the company that did the analysis, an engineering company, a small engineering company, um, used that GIS and uh, the construction company ended up with truckloads of dirt that they hadn't planned on based on this cut and fill analysis. What went wrong? Well, turns out that the uh, engineering company had used a digital terrain model that was derived from a small scale topographic map which obviously was not adequate for the task at this rather large scale operations and uh, this produced the error in calculations. Now, interestingly, uh, who got, saw, uh, who got uh, uh, sued in this process? It was not the engineering company, probably because there was not much money to be found there. Um, and you can advance the 
uh, deep pocket theory to say, well, maybe we should go after the GIS company. And it's an interesting question what um, responsibility the GIS company building software that allowed to do cut and fill computations, but also that allowed this mistake to be made, what uh, responsibility and what liability this uh, company should face. Clearly an issue of uh, something having gone wrong with scale. So lessons that uh, many of us, I guess, had to learn sometimes the hard way over time. There's just no such thing as scale-free spatial information or spatial data, even though at the beginning of the GIS enthusiasm one, and maybe still today, some people might think so. Um, and there are also no scale-free spatial analyses, um, probably not even um, single scale spatial analysis. If it's an interesting analysis, you basically always face the, the problem or the challenge or the situation that uh, data come at multiple scales and uh, this creates interesting questions as your seminar series ex explores. Yet, then came this guy, uh, it's a Pebisma, great colleague of mine at, while I was working at the University of Münster. Uh, we had him once at a, uh, at a Vespucci seminar in Tuscany uh, about multi-scale models in environmental and social sciences. And uh, he started his talk saying, forget scale. Now, what does that mean? How do we interpret that? Well, his, um, the basis of his claim or of this uh, call for forgetting scale uh, was and is, and I certainly subscribe to that, that the term scale is used in so many different senses, important senses. Um, there's not one that should be winning over the others. Uh, it's also uh, dominated by a, the traditional idea of the representative scale or ratio map scale. Uh, which plays some role, but maybe not the one that we are after when we talk about multi-scale analysis. Uh, it describes the extent of a uh, study area. It is, uh, a, to some extent, a synonym of resolution, of measurement precision. Uh, it is deeply uh, connected uh, to the idea of support in measurement theory. So the, the, the element, the space-time region over which you assume that some, some attribute like temperature or whatever you have uh, is hom homogeneous and you use this support to uh, define uh, the scale of, of your study. Uh, there's the idea of measurement scales, nominal ordinal, etc., which are obviously scales as well. And uh, finally, and I would suggest that's the one we want to focus on in at least today and, and maybe more generally when we study multi-scale analysis, level of detail, granularity. And this slide and this whole um, uh, um, mm -hmm. argument is certainly not about uh, a, a discussion of terminology. It is about what sense do we want to uh, interpret scale with what, in what sense do we use the term? And you can use any term that you want, whether that be scale or anything else. I will use the term granularity, which is another effect of my interest in, in ontology, uh, where ontologists typically refer to scale in the sense of uh, what is the, the grain of our analysis as granularity. Um, if you want a simpler term for this, and I'm sure you, you have been using it, are using it, level of detail uh, characterizes pretty well the idea of scale in the sense of granularity. Okay, so having uh, just declared how I use the term granularity, and uh, again, scale is just as fine if you keep that in mind. Uh, I was wondering, you may be wondering, many of us are wondering, so what exactly is multi, uh, is spatial multiscale analytics or analysis? Um, I suggest it is asking questions, spatial questions, spatial temporal questions. Uh, 
at multiple granularities. Um, and then the next question is, okay, so do these questions or to what extent do these questions, how do these questions depend on granularity? Do the answers depend on granularity, even if the questions don't? And my sense, and correct me if I'm wrong in, in the discussion, uh, my sense is we don't really have a good set of answers to these questions. We tend to even not make the questions, the spatial questions we ask very explicit when we do analysis that the whole technology has um, been taught to us. And sadly, many of us are also, or have to teach it this way as a procedural um, skill in which you apply certain computational procedures in order to produce a map or some type of result. And the question often gets lost in, in the complications of, of applying these procedures. Um, I'm usually using this state of affairs, which honestly, I, I especially regret in, in the context of teaching, uh, regretted and still regret, and, and, and it made me embark on the research that I'm talking about today. I'm, I'm um, comparing our situation in, science is using GIS or possibly even in a so-called geographic information science with some other sciences um, possibly more respected or, or even called the dismal science in the case of economics. It seems that a science um, to maybe earn the term um, should at least have some shared understanding, if not the consensus on what its core concepts are. What are the main uh, ideas? What are the, What is the main subject that a science is organized around? I'm told these days for biology, for example, um, everything centers on the cell. And of course, there's much more that, uh, what, that biology is after, but it's the cell as a core concept around which uh, the, the studies in bi biology, the other concepts in biology are organized. Um, in economics, I'm sure this as well can be disputed, but there is certainly an important uh, an importance uh, given to the notion of value, economic value, uh, from which then or around which other concepts like production, productivity, uh, and price, etc., are being organized. In uh, the field that some of us call our own and some of us call geographic information science, we pretty much lack, I guess, uh, an agreement or at least even some, some basic proposals on what such uh, core concepts would be around which that science should be organized. And I don't think that's very sustainable at the age of uh, just about 30 years of the science it might be good to um, uh, push that debate a bit further and think about um, candidates for core concepts. If you disagree with me, uh, I'd be happy actually to be told that I'm wrong. But here is two slides, uh, hopefully providing some evidence at, for the problem of a lack of core concepts. First one you're looking at is taken from the European uh, Inspire standard, which is a standard that the European Union has declared or imposed on its member, on its member states uh, for geographic information to be made available, uh, to be shared, um, regardless what country it is and with uh, certain modifications of the specifics. If you look at this catalog, and it's not even the complete catalog, I think, uh, um, it, the standard essentially names some 30 to 40 different themes about which uh, states typically collect spatial information, geographic information, and, and are expected to share it. Um, maybe that's the only way to do it, um, but it also reveals a bit of a haphazard nature of how we talk about the contents of uh, spatial databases uh, or uh, public information in this case. 
Um, if, if this first example was a one of maybe under abstraction, we don't have good abstractions to summarize, to talk about classes, types of spatial information, geographic information. Uh, the second slide uh, taken actually, uh, or based on a admittedly very early proposal from uh, John Sowa, a highly respected, uh, uh, including by me, uh, ontologist who said, well, uh, let's look at examples of ontologies. A geographic ontology might be one that distinguishes points, lines, and areas. You're reminded of, you're reminded of uh, points, lines, and polygons. Uh, for many of us being sort of the ontology around which GIS and GIS teaching and GIS learning is centered. But it's obviously a very poor and impoverished and, and, and in some sense over abstracted, namely only, rent, only at the geometric level um, relevant uh, ontology of geography. So if we had a better sense of the core concepts of geographic information, spatial information, uh, or even of geography from the point of view of, of information technology, we would probably do better in coming up with such ontologies. And of course, people are doing better. And there's many proposals. What I'm saying here is that there's a bit of a, uh, um, a, a lack of consensus in the field of geographic information science on uh, such core concepts and such ontologies that are generally useful. So this is what the core concepts of spatial information that I've been working on with grad students for um, quite some time now uh, are attempting to do, attempting to, to define a, uh, well, a set of core concepts, which basically comes down to defining what spatial information is about. We have done a lot of research, our field has, and uh, we're, teaching a lot of details about spatial information in terms of how it is being modeled, how it is being represented, how it is being acquired, uh, shared, um, uh, integrated, etc. But we, strangely enough, don't have really good ways to talk about what spatial information is about, except to you know, have that type of catalog that you've seen from Inspire. Uh, sort of endless enumerations, almost endless enumerations of, well, it's about uh, transportation, uh, it's about uh, um, topography, it's about names, it's about uh, administrative subdivisions, and on and on and on. Um, so the first goal, and, and, and that remains the main goal of, of this work, is to come up with a simpler, which means just shorter list of uh, contents that spatial information uh, is about or, or is meant to, to talk about. And the more we were working at this, and in particular in my collaboration with, with colleagues in, in Australia at the University of Melbourne, um, we started noticing that actually what this means is we don't have a clear understanding uh, of spatial questions. And since question answering systems have become quite important and, and there's a lot of research going into them, um, I started looking at uh, some of this research also as an advisor on some of these theses, and noticed, well, most people are trying to sort of, to put it not very respectfully to start a butterfly collection of questions that have been asked by people in similar situations or actually on, on similar systems. We don't seem to have a, again, a good uh, structuring, a good ontology of what spatial questions can be. What can you possibly ask about in a certain context of understanding space in a certain way? And uh, that may be the way of, of a GIS. So uh, the more recent goal of, of the same work still, which is still in progress, uh, is to go beyond just, or, or, or maybe reformulate the idea of um, core concepts are what spatial information is about into core concepts are essentially the basis for a theory of spatial questions. So let me, um, 
try to give a simple example based on a illustration here from Christina Last, who is working with us on, on illustrating uh, this research for a book that I'm writing with Karen Kemp. Um, consider yourself in a situation of planning a hike. And in planning a hike, a day hike, for example, around here, Santa Barbara, uh, what we're wondering, uh, we're wondering about certain questions like how long will it take, um, how steep will it be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are reflected in this drawing and then uh, specified in the following table. Uh, you might have, you might ask the question, how long is this a particular trail? How steep? Does it get at its maximum? Um, can I use public transport to get there? And specifically what bus uh, goes to the trail or the trailhead? And um, how long is the trail was the distance question, but it is also a question of how, when can you get back? Maybe also in combination with the bus. Uh, can I get back before dusk? Um, these are obviously not um, not rocket science questions. These are day-to-day -day questions that you ask, that we all ask uh, around activities that take place in space. Um, I'm showing them here because I want to argue, or I want to use this as an example uh, to demonstrate um, the um, types of things we ask questions about, spatial questions about. And this is highlighted in the second column of this table. Um, the question how long a trail is seems to be asking about a property of the entire object of the trail, namely its, its length from start to end. Um, the question how steep does it get uh, is a bit trickier and uh, seems to have to do with how the, uh, in technical terms, field of um, slope uh, of the terrain um, behaves along the trail and where it reaches its maximum. The third question, what bus goes to it, um, relates that trail somewhere up in the hills uh, to uh, the bus network in town and tries to find a line and, and the station of a bus line that is close enough to the trailhead. And um, the fourth final question here, uh, can I get back before dusk, um, shifts our attention from the purely potentially or from the mainly spatial aspects uh, to uh, a question that is spatial temporal, namely if I do all this um, hike um, and leave at a certain time or at what time would I need to leave, uh, can I or so that I will get back before another event starts, in this case, dusk or night. So I'm not sure you agree with me, but the questions uh, seem to be relatively straightforward. The, the, uh, the analysis of the question in terms of what are they about, of course, uh, was not um, uh, invented. Uh, but uses terms, uses ideas for as potential core concepts that uh, have been uh, advanced and talked about and systematized in the literature for a long time. The idea of an object uh, being an individual uh, that exists in space and time, the idea of a field being a distribution of attribute values in a certain region, possibly in an, around an object or in an object. Um, the idea of a network uh, being uh, a uh, set of objects that are linked by some type of connection. Uh, and the idea of an event um, being something that's happening in space and time uh, and is clearly connected to um, some of the other um, core concepts, objects, fields, and networks, in particular by changing them. But that's uh, something I'll skip for the moment. So um, if we can more or less agree on these four highlighted red terms here as being useful conceptualizations, useful, not so much the terms, but useful ideas about which we ask spatial questions, then let's move on 
uh, to the next level. Um, just maybe you should be inspired by children who, when you um, when they ask a question and you give them an answer, they will most likely come up with another question, uh, questioning your answer or, or asking questions about what you say in your answer. Um, this uh, is a pretty healthy strategy. Um, and it, I would argue it's something we do have always done and, and, and uh, should never neglect to do in the context of uh, information systems, spatial information systems in particular. And what I'm doing here in this second table is just um, suggest a um, second set of questions on top of the first set, which takes as its basis the answers given to the first set. So if the question of the first set was how long is the trail and the answer might be the trail is 15 kilometers long, a uh, reasonable, at least in some context, um, follow up question on this answer would be, well, is this actually the length of the trail or is it just a distance, point to point distance, straight line distance between start and end point? Um, if you think that's silly, uh, just look at uh, Google Maps answer to a question like, uh, where's the next gas station while you're driving? And then try to reach it with your last drops of gas in the tank. I've tried to do that and failed because uh, the distance is actually point to point distance because it would be too much effort at query time to evaluate the actual driving distance uh, to the closest gas station. Anyway, second, um, Example here, the maximum slope is 15%. Uh, could be an answer to the question, how steep does the trail get? Um, and here, a practical question, whether one knows more or less about uh, how these things are being computed is maybe less the question, uh, but a practical question is, okay, is this 15% really the maximum or is it just, um, end uh, elevation minus start elevation uh, divided by uh, the length or possibly even the distance of the trail. Um, and that raises um, questions about the granularity of, of that slope information. And if you go to any definitions of, of hiking guides uh, or underlying hiking guides or websites, you will find pretty careful um, um, statements about what the intervals are at which uh, slope is being measured and then averaged or a maximum being determined. Um, trying to quickly conclude on the other two questions or with the other two questions, um, a follow-up question on the answer to the bus uh, going to the trailhead would be, well, is the bus information you're using still valid? or is it valid on that particular day, which may be a Sunday, uh, which essentially asks about, okay, where did you get this from? What's the provenance of uh, the data that they have used in your analysis? And finally, um, if the system, the hiking app, for example, tells me, well, you can get back during daylight um, if you leave now or by 11 a.m. or whatever, um, it obviously has to make some assumptions about how fast I'm hiking, as well as possibly some others. What are these assumptions? What are the processes used to compute the end time? So without attempting any completeness, um, but attempting hopefully some, some practical relevance uh, to achieve that, um, I would argue these are reasonable second level questions, meta questions, questions about, as we call it technically, the quality of the information uh, in terms of its accuracy, its granularity, uh, its provenance uh, or lineage as uh, used to be called, uh, both in terms of the data that went into uh, an answer as well as uh, the computations that went into it. All right, I've given you sort of a, an intentionally bottom-up perspective on core concepts. Of course, I realize that many of you have um, a very technical, have a technical background uh, understanding much more than I was uh, able to summarize here about all these concepts. 
Here's another, uh, here's a summary of uh, the core concepts that I've tried to motivate through the simple hiking example. At the bottom line, what you see are uh, the four concepts of fields, objects, networks, and events. I call them content concepts because they describe the content of spatial information, what spatial information is about. However, if that's, as I said, our aspiration that we should have a better way of describing what spatial information and spatial questions are about, then the second level is equally important and, and cannot be left away. And that's the quality level, the types of questions that I ask about scale or resolution or granularity, which is the term we use, uh, accuracy and provenance. And yes, you can argue there's more, uh, there's more quality questions. There's possibly more content questions or content concepts. I'm pretty confident that we have um, reached some type of closure at the level of typical GIS or spatial analysis um, um, questions and, and data and information with the core content concepts on the basis um, whether quality needs to be extended with some other concepts or questions is, is debatable. Um, at the moment, we are pretty happy with these as well. So, um, just taking from this slide, the top left concept, the granularity concept as being the one of interest when we talk about um, multi-scale spatial analysis. Um, let's briefly look at maybe one of the most important feature of features of all these concepts, namely how they interact with the others, how they play with others. Turns out granularity plays very well and needs to play with others um, in ways that are pretty familiar to many of us. Um, so for example, let's look at how granularity plays with each of the um, base uh, content concepts. If we think of what we know about the granularity of fields, and I'm showing here fields represented as raster data, which is not necessarily what one always does, but a typical representation. Most of us are familiar with the, the essential um, um, need or, or step of defining uh, cell size, grid size, resolution, you name it. Uh, it's always the granularity of a field, be that about air quality or uh, population density or you name it. So the idea of granularity is, is, is fundamentally built into the field concept. You cannot even define field, uh, a field model and, and certainly not the field representation without being explicit about its granularity. Um, what about objects, the object concept? Um, I'm taking this example from Chetty's work on intergenerational mobility, which I found interesting in many, many ways relevant to our field. And by the way, Chetty is an economist. Um, what they had to um, seriously consider when they did this analysis, uh, um, meta study on how intergenerational mobility has may or may not have changed over the past generation. Uh, they had to pick the aerial unit, famous um, modifiable aerial unit problem. They had to decide on how do we measure it and especially on what spatial units do we measure um, things like uh, changes in income or education or uh, whatever else went into the study. And they decided against um, counties, which they argue are not very suitable for a variety of reasons. Um, they argued against several other options and finally identified uh, a spatial unit of so-called commuting zone, which seems to have a lot to do with the daily behavior and, and the economics of, of uh, a certain region, more than a relatively arbitrary um, county limit would have. And they decided this is the object, the commuting zone. 
uh, across uh, the United States will be the object for which we measure the properties that influence or that reflect intergenerational mobility. Um, I felt this was a, a, an illustrative case of granularity decisions or a granularity decision being made um, about objects for the purpose of um, a multi-scale, uh, both in terms of space and time, spatial analysis. Um, here's some work actually done at the University of Maine ages ago by our friend and colleague Sabine Timpf, and we extended, it, we extended it a little later to look at the granularity of networks. Uh, in this case, inter the interstate network and its connection to lower level uh, transportation. And uh, we found that um, while we typically think of networks as being well represented by graphs, the story gets rather interesting and more complicated, but still remains within the um, purview of spatial analysis with the concept of networks. Um, if we consider the various stages of planning a trip, um, driving, um, or in between giving instructions for taking a trip and then taking the trip or driving the trip. In each of these cases, there were networks involved, the network concept was involved, but at a different granularity. And of course, we're all fami familiar with hierarchies of networks um, that are used to um, um, represent graphs, uh, to represent uh, um, phenomena like transportation, uh, but also hydrology and, and many others. And finally, how does the granularity concept interact with um, the event concept? Uh, I'm sure you've seen or possibly have seen this figure, um, which on the left and on the right has the same amount of pebbles and um, smaller grains. Uh, and the metaphor being illustrated with the figure is, if you start your day by doing the big tasks first, you are more likely to uh, be able to fill in everything that you need during a day. So that's granularity at the temporal level, granularity at the event level, uh, illustrated through an experience we all uh, make during uh, when we schedule activities. Then, uh, finishing up this story about interactions between multiple uh, core concepts. Um, to some extent, even more interesting are the interactions at the same level, in this case, at the, at the upper level of the quality questions between that singled out concept of granularity. And in this case, the other two, namely accuracy and um, provenance. Uh, I find personally most interesting and, and a bit undervalued, I think, in both the teaching and, and even my own and our own understanding of spatial information, the idea that granularity is, is not just a pain in the neck when we deal with data, um, but it's also super helpful and a, a tool, a, a concept available to um, do something very useful um, as long as we do it explicitly, which is to hide uncertainty, to hide inaccuracy. So when I tell you that I am in California, I'm hiding um, maybe the, not the fact that I don't know any better, but I could give you much more precise information, uh, but I'm 100% accurate in this statement. And, and this is a principle we find at work uh, time and again in spatial information, um, saying that or, or, or allowing us to state information at the level that we know it accurately um, by elevating uh, the granularity in it. And well, this was the story about how granularity interacts with accuracy. Um, there's, of course, also stories about how granularity interacts with, with provenance. And I would argue um, provenance, which has for, for decades been said or lineage to be one of, if not the most important uh, 
quality parameter for spatial data and spatial information. Um, provenance in particular is often sought and, and should have been so, uh, sought out in, in this particular story about the cut and fill disaster um, to, in order to get a handle on the granularity. So if they knew that the digital terrain model had been derived from a um, small scale topographic map, various uh, red lights should have flashed uh, before disaster struck. So let me try to uh, conclude and hopefully uh, then have some interesting questions. Um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, any spatial analysis, but in particular when a, a decidedly multi-scale spatial analysis analytics uh, needs to make scale explicit. And in my terms, this would be needs to make uh, granularity explicit in the questions it asks. So we need an understanding of Okay, what question uh, are we asking here? How does that question depend on scale? How does the answer depend on scale or granularity? And I don't think we are quite there yet overall as, a, as an approach to spatial information and spatial analytics in general. <clears throat> um, which basically means, or can be rephrased, or I would rephrase it as we lack a theory of spatial questions, which as I mentioned, hurts even more now that we are trimming our systems or re revamping a lot of our spatial information systems into question answering systems. Um, and it uh, means more specifically that we also have no explicit uh, theory or account for scale or granularity as it relates to spatial questions. Uh, I would uh, suggest that this set of core concepts of spatial information um, are a uh, proposal to achieve this, as well as some other um, hopeful, hopefully benefits, in particular more clarity in the learning, the teaching, uh, and also the designing of uh, geographic information technology. <clears throat> and before getting to the question, let me uh, do some uh, outrageous uh, speculations, which my biology teacher that field that has these, this wonderful uh, solid theoretical basis um, uh, taught us we should never do, um, we should never speculate, but I'll do it anyway. Um, I think in that range of core concepts or whatever other range you prefer to have or, or set you prefer to have as core concepts for what you're doing in spatial computing, um, granularity has a special, some type of a, some sense, in some sense, a nexus position uh, because it relates the spatial and temporal concepts to the quality concepts in being itself a spatial and temporal unit of measurement concept. Uh, plus, it's also, as I guess all the examples, and, and, and I'm sure your motivation for coming here show, it's just really essential to get a handle on granularity more than it is, at least in general, on provenance or even accuracy. Um, a even wilder speculation is I'm increasingly wondering, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, whether sciences as we have them today, disciplines as we have them, are um, coping or able to cope with the challenges in the world uh, when they remain separated by essentially ranges of scale or granularity. Geography is defined by a spatial scale and that's fine and useful, but also now in the context of um, pandemics, for example, you wonder how spatial questions uh, play into um, uh, solving current problems that are at the edges or beyond uh, the typical geographic analysis. Think of, um, you know, uh, a viral infection having spatial aspects going from the scale of the virus itself to intercontinental air travel. And finally, um, a, a hobby thought I've been having for decades, I think I, it actually started occurring to me in Maine and I've never had the time so far to pursue it. It's time for retiring, obviously. Um, could even an aesthetics be founded on the possibility of certain phenomena in the world to be perceived at multiple 
scales or granularities. We, we talk about depths um, that we find and that makes us uh, feel that something is more beautiful, more uh, um, interesting than something else. And I guess this has to do with granularity. Let me leave it at this and uh, hand back to Kathleen to guide us through questions. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. Great, thank you, Werner. Thank you very much. Lots to think about there. Let's see. Um, Carl, hello to Carl, um, asks, after one of the early slides, the term geographic disappeared. Is spatial information and its core concepts a subset of geographic information and its core concepts, or does it matter? Good question, a question that uh, has to come and be asked. And I acknowledge I've been a bit careless in, in making, I didn't want to make too much of distinction. Um, I consider spatial to be a broader in many senses uh, uh, idea than geographic, but I realized that geographic concerns are not just spatial. So there's a bit of a, uh, a mutual dependence here. As when it comes to the core concepts, I would hope to be able to show that they are not just core to geographic analysis, but they are uh, equally core possibly um, to uh, other spatial analyses such as those occurring in or necessary in chemistry, molecular analysis or, or interstellar uh, travel or whatever scale you want to work at. 